uh, but you can ask us to think clearly and logically, which is what, of course, you're always seeking to do. And to come to that, you do so fearlessly, if I may say so. You've spent quite a bit of time critiquing and writing about one of your books, Darwin, Darwinian Evolution. Uh, now, overwhelmingly, people will say evolution is an established fact. It's wholly writ. I suspect almost no one would dare to question uh, it, uh, almost no one, there are people who do, uh, and a great number of them, of course, would say, well, of course, it just satisfies this question of God, he's not needed. Uh, in fact, you argue that far from being beyond doubt, uh, that um, there's not a lot of intellectual credibility in Darwinism. Can you tell us, because it's worth recapping, what is Darwinian evolution, and why you believe we really need to be a little more open-eyed about the claims that rest upon that theory. You've got an organism, and we know that DNA, the genetic code, is really like a book of instructions, modern point of view. All right, that's okay. And uh, we know that accidents happen. Sometimes cats become bits, C-A-T-S becomes B-I-T-S, that sort of thing. Letters change. Things are swapped around. That is random mutation. It's random because it's completely uncoupled from what happens to the organism or any causal structure beyond the organism. It just happens yeah, like a roulette wheel. The changes that those random mutations provoke result in changes to the organism. Some may be good, some may be bad. The elephant who began life as a species with a very short trunk, gradually enlarges the size of its trunk because having a long snout proved extremely valuable out there, the African belt. That's the kind of anecdotal story that's told. <clears throat> Over a long period of time, these beneficial changes completely uh, change the constitutive structure of an organ organism so that a land-dwelling creature, a moose, a cow, something like a wolf, becomes a whale. Just a small, inevitable, inexorable uh, series of continuous changes, progressive changes. And that was Darwin's answer to the question, the origin of the species, question mark. As far as uh, I am concerned, it's it's a perfectly fine myth or fable. It's got a certain amount of truth to it. Mutations are random. But it is at an enormous distance from the scientific theory. Look, we have magnificent examples of what a scientific theory looks like. We've got general relativity. We've got quantum mechanics. We've got the standard model of particle physics. These are rich, deep, detailed, accounts of the physical world. You're going to tell me that all of your questions about life are assignable to copying errors in the DNA and lucky breaks out there on the African plains? That's not enough. We need some first principles. We need some rich, a rich body, a, a rich predictive apparatus. You want to know what Darwinian theory really is like? I think, um, there's, a, there's a, a fable you can use to illustrate it. Instead of asking about the origin of species, or the species, uh, ask about the origins of the, the novel, the European novel. Where did war and peace come, come from? Well, I can tell you, all European novels were derived ultimately from Don Quixote. They're all descendants of, that was the last common ancestor. Don Quixote was published in Spanish, but this was before the printing press, of course, before uh, the internet. And uh, monks were charged with the responsibility of copying it from one generation to the next. And in copying, inevitably, they made a few mistakes, changed D to a B, changed the Q to a Z, changed the punctuation. And over a very long period of time, 400 years, all those copying errors changed on Quixote to War and Peace. Are you satisfied with that explanation? Would you spend a lot of time listening to my account of how Don Quixote became War and Peace? 
Would you give me a whole pile of money to further my research and the transmigration of literary form? I suspect, I can't say with any truth, but I suspect your answer is, you know, that doesn't sound right. That, that doesn't, doesn't have the ring of truth. I think uh, the fact that we can talk about Darwinian theory on this level of naivete, uh, something we could never do with the standard model of particle physics, never, 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 uh, indicates that what we're dealing with is perhaps a theory with some important insights, although I doubt it. Uh, we're dealing with a very immature thought structure. Uh, the 19th century has magnificent, made th magnificent theoretical advances, but I think the figure is not Darwin, but Maxwell, who developed the theory of electromagnetism, gave it a mathematical form at roughly the same time. In addition, it seems to me that <clears throat> Darwinian, Darwinian theory, as Darwin himself expressed it, is crippled by a typical 19th century assumption of continuity. That is, everything is a process of gradual change. Like everyone else, he was deeply impressed with the success of Newtonian mechanics and Newtonian mechanics. It's continuous theory. Uh, continuous theory. It appeals to the continuum, the endless number of small, small interventions that life makes in order to create the magnificent thing that's an elephant. What is uh, seldom recognized is that on a fundamental level, Darwinian theory really is a theory of the lucky brain. It's all random. Um, biologists will say, well, the mutations are random, but natural selection, which culls the results of mutations and keeps the good, gets rid of the bad, that's deterministic. It's not so. Uh, natural selection works in a particular environment, and environments, as far as we know, change randomly. So the elephant in developing a 10-foot trunk may have had a great success in Africa, but had the elephant been forced to rent a two-story walk-up in Brooklyn, that 10-foot trunk may not have been such a good thing. We have no general theory of how environments change or how to pair changes in the environments to changes in the, in the organism. So it's entirely random, and the answer uh, to the origin of the species is, in the end, let's be honest, lucky breaks. That's the way things turned out when the great roulette wheel of life turned. I think you and I, especially you and I, uh, we have a deep hunger for a deeper theory. What that theory is, I don't know.